Um, okay, so what we're looking at, so the other day we looked at network topologies and there was one network topology that had a server in it. What was it? Uh, uh, Good, okay. And what were the other two? Excellent. Very good. Okay, there is this theory that, say for example, in a star, you've got the server in the center, the other computers that are in the star, we That's called it. them nodes the other day. Yeah, That's it there, okay? Yeah. So we've got the server in the center and we've got the, the yeah. nodes around the outside. Yes. Now, those nodes, if they're computers, they're called clients, right? The reason is because the client is served by the server, okay? So it's kind of like very similar to how you would be in a restaurant. You are the client and somebody that comes to serve you is your waitress, okay? So the, the client actually has the stuff done for them from the server. So for example, if you're a print server, then the server prints, um, the client accesses the server in order to print. No, you're right? Okay, so. Is that recording you talking? Yes, it is. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Okay, so the role of the client and server. The server provides processing resources and servers to the client machine. The types of services that it provides are different depending on the type of server it is. So if it's a print server, it provides print resources. If it's an email server, it provides email services. Okay, it can provide a couple of different things though. Um, client machines are generally just personal computers. So like these computers in this room, they're all clients to our server. Okay, so the servers itself can be really big computers, like our school server. It actually takes up like a big um, table like this, like a big cupboard. Okay, it's taller than me. That's our server. Um, however, you can also have a client-server relationship with two computers. So you can have um, a server computer being one personal computer and a client computer being another personal computer. Or you can have a client... Um, server relationship between, say, for example, your iPhone and your laptop. Okay, similar to you know my Kino remote on my um, on my iPod. Yeah. That is a client, and it's being served by the computer. Okay, because there's a link between them. You don't need to write every word, particularly because it's being recorded. But like maybe just what I'm talking about rather than um, every word. Okay. In comparison, so there's client and server, okay, and peer-to-peer, -peer, I don't believe is in the syllabus. However, it's good to have an understanding of what the differences are, okay, because it makes client and server a little bit clearer. Um, in peer-to-peer -peer architecture, so you know like when you don't illegally um, share music on the internet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 right? That is called peer-to-peer. -peer. The reason is because there's no server, right? It's just a relationship between two computers. So both of the computers can be clients and both of the computers can be servers. That's really powerful because um, it limits the amount of centralization needed. So with, with servers, there needs to be a central computer, right? With peer-to-peer -peer and the reason that it actually got developed is because if you can't, you can shut down a whole system by shutting down the server. In peer-to-peer, -peer, you can't shut down that system, okay? Because both computers can be servers, both computers can be clients, all right? So Napster, for example, you guys remember Napster? Yeah. yeah. Years and years ago, all right? That was um, a centralised system. So there was a server, that server stored music, so they could shut it down really easily. LimeWire is a peer-to-peer -peer program, so it can't be shut down. Because if you're serving him and he's serving him, and he's serving him, and he's serving him, okay? Which one do you shut down? You don't know, okay? And if you shut down one, okay, so say Mark, for example, gets shut down, right? You just share with Jordan. Yeah, that's exactly right, yep. So, and most of them are called like P2P or something. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, um, the client-server model is a form of distributed processing where computers are used to perform specific information processes necessary to achieve the system's purpose. What that's saying is, sometimes your computer can collect information and the server actually processes, transmits and receives, 
it stores and res, um, retrieves. Okay, so the, the, the server does all of the information processes aside from collecting and displaying. Right? Now, in processing, what happens is between the client and server, um, it happens sequentially, so one after the other. The server can't be serving and the client sending at the same time. So you've got the client um, here requesting information, it goes down, it's the server processes it, it sends it back, and then the client processes it. So the client processes, server processes, client processes, server processes. And there's no mixing of the two. They can't happen at the same time. All right, here's a lovely little picture. So what you have here is your computer in the center. This is your server. This link here is to the internet. Right? So whenever you see that little lightning bolt and the cloud, that means it's linked to a wide area network. Generally, that means that it's the internet. Okay? It's also linked to a printer. It's linked to an external um, storage drive. Right? Um, and these computers here are being served by the, the server. Now you can also have a mobile phone that is in a client relationship with that computer. So in this case here, for this one with the mobile phone, that computer there, that laptop, is actually serving the client that is the mobile phone while being the client for the central server computer. So it's just a client for the phone? Yeah, so that's right. So this is a, the, the phone is a client. It is being served by the laptop. The laptop is being served by the server. Yeah. Okay, so you can have different relationships amongst the same, um, within the same network. Okay, now, NOS. Um, in larger operating systems, so with a basic computer network, you do not really need a network operating system. However, in larger networks, you generally have them. So for example, we have Novell here. So when you log into the computers, you can see the login screen, it actually says at the top of it, Novell. All right, what Novell does for us is authenticates you. So it actually, um, when you log on, it checks that your log on is real. So if you come into the school, and you're new, you can't actually log into a computer until you have a network username and password. Okay? It also controls, so the network operating system is like the software that controls all the services that the server provides. So it actually um, takes your files and puts them on the server. Okay? So do you guys have home drives? Yeah. Okay? Your home drives are st stored on the server. Okay? Novell manages those files so that it knows where to put it, so that um, Adam's not accessing Nick's files and Nick's not accessing Adam's files, um, and that it's printing to the right printer. So like, say, for example, when I print your results, I'm not actually printing them to the library, okay, because that would be an issue, wouldn't it? If I print out a page worth of your, um, your assessment results and I accidentally print them to the library where every, any kid can come along and pick them up, that would be a privacy issue, okay? It would. It would, absolutely. Okay, now, there are such a thing as fat clients and thin clients. <laughs> yes, it's funny. <laughs> okay, um, I'm a thin client. Um, the client machine, basically, what that means is if you're a fat client, um, your computer actually does all of the work. So the client does all of the work. Okay, um, what it does, the server just performs some functions. So it might save stuff but all of the processing is done on the computers. So we here, we have fat clients here, okay? Because we're doing, all of the programs are installed on the computers, on the clients, all of the processing. So if you're working a, um, a program, it's not connecting you to the server and the, the server's not doing the work for the computer, okay? The, the, the program is actually running locally on the client. It's nothing to do with the server. When you save files on the server, they save to um, the server and that then becomes what the server is used for. Okay? In comparison, thin clients. Okay? Thin clients are also known as dumb terminals. Uh -huh. Actually, maybe I'm not a thin client. Um, <laughs> terminals only perform basic processing tasks. So basically, your terminal or your client in this section, it has um, no programs installed on it aside from basic stuff. The programs are stored on the server. When you do something on um, your client, it's actually accessing the server and the server is processing stuff and you're coming back. So for example, remote desktop is an example of this, right? Because I can actually use my laptop 
and I can work something off the server. Now, if your server's really good, that's a really good way to do it because it means that all of your computers, you get really cheap computer clients, okay, a really good server and some good networking, and you can have really, really fast clients because all of the processing is done on the server. Okay? However, if your server's not good, it's not such a good deal. Because if your server's not good, or if you don't have a good networking structure, then you can't really do much on the clients aside from just collect and display. Okay. Um, this is really good basically um, for people working from home. Well, actually, I was talking to Mr. Ellis the other day, who was talking about the iPad, right? You know, which is re like really just a really expensive um, big iPod Touch. Right? However, what he was saying is that you can actually run remote desktop on the iPad. So he could be sitting there using remote desktop in order to run video editing software that's installed on our software and using, uh, sorry, on our server and using the processing power of the server in order to run it off the iPad. So you could have like Photoshop or you know, um, video editing suite on your iPad that's actually running off the server. So you've got the processing power of the server and you're not using the processing power or the storage of the iPad. Okay, so that's one one thing that you could do with it. <laughs> that's right, because I actually um, just rendered it. That's why. I, yeah. All right, guys, thank you. Okay, so another example. So we just looked at the mail example. Another example is an actual web browser. So Internet Explorer, um, Firefox. These are web clients, right? Being served by web servers. A web server is where you actually place the HTML files and all of the image files and all of the programming files that make up a website. So when you type into um, into a search bar, www.google.com, sorry, in the URL bar, um, what that does is it finds the HTML file that's called index.htm on the Google website, on their web server, it downloads the index.htm file to your web browser, then it finds the file that's called Google logo.jpg, I'm guessing here. Um, it transfers that file across, and it also transfers um, some other files, like it will have a cascading style sheet, and the cascading style sheet is what lays out the web page. Okay, so you've got your HTML file that stores the information, You've got the CSS file that lays out the web page, and you've got the image file. When you type in something in Git search, it accesses a PHP file, which is like a programming language, on the server, and that PHP file searches a database, and then that database sends back your information to your web client. Sounds like a hell of a long process, doesn't it? Yeah, just typing it's in it's like okay. That's right, it does it in milliseconds. So all of that stuff is happening, like you think about it too, like your server after this isn't next door or in the same building, you're talking about servers in California or China, right? Um, so that that's going like worldwide and hitting you back those results within a couple of seconds. Pretty amazing thing. So a web browser is a client program running on a user's computer that accesses information stored on the, on the web. Um, users, for example, another example, users accessing banking services from their computer use a web browser client to send a request to a web server at a bank. Okay, so when you're looking at your um, banking details online, you've got your HTML pages, you've got all of the information from your bank. That program then actually might um, request information from the bank database. So you know how we were talking when we were doing databases, I said databases and webs actually like interact really well because all of the big um, websites are actually just database driven. Right? Um, that then sends to a request to a database server in another bank computer to retrieve the account information. That account information in your balance is returned to the bank database client which then returns it to your computer. Okay, so it's got three steps. You've got the bank server, okay, the client might be in the branch, so you might be accessing something in your local branch, which then sends it to a bigger server. So you can have a number of servers within a system, the same way you can have a number of clients. Okay, next. Print servers. 
um, in small offices or home local area networks, which is LAN. One machine may be linked to the internet and becomes an internet server for all other machines. So if you've got like these two computers here, we'll call this one Mark and this one Justin, yes. right? Justin can be the internet server. So in order to, for Mark to access the internet, he has to access the internet through Justin. Right? Justin's connected to the modem. It's good because he talks so much that you know he can like talk to the modem and the modem can talk to the internet. Okay? Um, so Mark has to access the internet through Justin. Right? Mark, however, is connected to the printer. Right? So he is like king of the printer and Justin is king of the internet. So Justin has Justin has to talk to Mark in order to access the printer. So if Justin's talking to Mark and Mark's accessing the printer, who is the print server? Good. Okay, who's the client? Justin. Good. Okay. Now if Mark um, wants to access the internet and Justin is king of the internet, like king of the whole internet, um, who is the client here? Good. And who's the server? Good. Okay. Now, this, what, if, um, what if we want to access the internet or the print at the same time? Well, that's a good question. It depends on the type of network you are. Okay. So remember, if it's a bus network and you want to access at the same time, and when you're talking about at the same time with computers, you're talking about like microseconds. So, like, say for example, you guys both talking at the same time for us might seem like highly likely. But for two computers, when you're talking about sending messages in microseconds, the likelihood isn't big when you've only got two computers. When you've got 600, statistically, that's going to be much more likely. All right, now, protocols, which is the next part. So we've done the client-server model. These are now protocols. So, handshaking. Handshaking, oh. What is it? AJ. Is it Sorry? Excellent. Remember when I did the embarrassing oh. 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 Army, army, so when the they are yeah, right, the, the dial-up mode. Yeah, the, the database of the dialogue between the they have to check if they're talking the same language. Yeah. Yes, good. Okay. Yeah. So basically making sure that both Parts of the system are talking the same language, which is dialoguing. So when you're doing the beep, beep, that is actually recording, yes. Um, when you're doing that, that is the sound of the two computers handshaking in order to decide what protocols they're going to use. Why is it important? So they, they speak their own language and they're not going to understand each other. Yep. So it's just a whole big thing. Yep, good. Okay. okay, because you're talking at doing things at a binary level. Almost. Yeah, exactly. But a little bit higher than binary in terms of you're talking um, about it doing like in a programming language, right? So if you're talking one programming language and the other one's talking another programming language, which are your protocols, right? The way that data is sent, um, and you're talking in different languages, then each computer can't communicate with each other, which is obviously very important. Yes, we have done this one. Good that you recognised it. Okay, so this is the functions performed within a system, within a communication system. There are three layers. You need to know what these layers are. Application uh, level, communication. Yeah, okay, I should have blocked them out. Okay, so the application level, because obviously you're very smart and you can read off the board. What is the application level? The users in the that's Don't just randomly pick syllabus <laughs> terms. What is the application level dealing with? Sending a message and receiving a message. That's the whole system. That's the whole system. So, when, what is an application? It's a program. Yeah, good. Okay. So, when you're looking at the application level, you're looking at just what you can see on the computer program. So, when you're dealing with an email client, um, you're just seeing who you're sending to, you're typing in the message, okay? That's the application level. Now, we'll skip the next one for a second. What's the transmission level? What's the breakdown? That's the same here. It transmits from the router. So that's here. That's from not the application level. 
that's the two levels together. Okay, so what's the bottom level do? Sending it from back still. It's like sending it from his computer Excellent. Okay. So at a base level, so when it's going through the wires, sending it from like here to Kuma. Right. I'll use that from the prayer. Um, so when you're sending it from here to Kuma, um, the, the fact that it's going through certain wires to get to a certain point. Right? What's the middle bit then? So if we're dealing with the application level, we've got that. And you've got the um, the other end is the sending it through the wires. What's the middle level? And what is encoding and decoding? Breaks down and Yep. And what piece of hardware does the encoding and decoding? Your computer. What modulates and demodulates? Modem. Good. Okay. So these three levels. These three levels are um, basically make up how a communication system runs. You need to know those three levels, you need to know what they are and what they do, okay, because a lot of the this um, topic is based around the fact that at an addressing level a communication system does this, at a base level it does this, transmission level, sorry. Okay, so, oops, at an application level, these are protocols that occur at an application level. So HTTP you know, hopefully, uh, SMTP, you should know because we did it five minutes ago, um, and SSL, which you may not know. At an application level, these are the three pro um, protocols that you use. Do we want to shut that down? He got caught five minutes ago, actually, I was trying to be subtle. Um, <laughs> clearly didn't work. SSL. Okay, so HTTP deals with the internet, obviously. It's your web browser protocol. So it is hypertext transfer protocol. So the P is actually protocol. Generally speaking, if it's a communication question, the P will be protocol. Okay. Um, in HTTP, web browsers or spiders, a spider is like a, the thing that searches the internet. Okay, a spider is like a little program that goes and searches a whole heap of things and then creates patterns from that data. So Google used spiders to search the internet to find web pages and to index them in Google so that when you search, then that gives you back those results. Is that like um, the anchors and the Yeah, so we'll, later on um, in the year we'll talk about data mining, which is, um, you should, we should have done it in um, information systems and databases as well. Um, data mining takes uh, a whole heap of information and makes meaning out of it. Spiders do the same thing, that's right. Um, well, so basically your web browsers and spiders are um, clients and an application running on the computer hosting the website acts as the server. So all of the files are stored on servers, um, that is transferred using HTTP. You'll know it because it's the first part of most web pages, HTTP dot dot, actually it's colon, um, slash slash www. Okay. What happens if it's HTTPS? Good. Excellent. Okay. SMTP. Remember, this is being recorded. You don't have to write everything down. Okay. SMTP is Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. So we talked about that a second ago. So SMTP has to do with um, what? Sending or receiving? Sending. 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 Yep. Actually, that, that is a better term, transmitting email messages. Right? Um, the other one here is um, POP, which is what? Receiving. Receiving, excellent. Okay. And IMAP is receiving also. Why do they have two different protocols for receiving? Different types of computers. Different types of Basically, they just created two different protocols. It's kind of like the beta and VHS thing. Or for you guys, um, HD and Blu-ray. Oh. Ah. <laughs> oh my god, I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's like two standards, and they're trying to decide what's what's the best standard. Yeah. Did you seriously not get the VHS beta? No. Oh god. <laughs> 
Go home and do some research. You know VHS is like videos? When VHS came out, there was another competing product called Beta, which was actually a higher quality, and um, you would buy a VHS recorder or a Beta recorder, and you could buy videos on VHS or on Beta, and eventually Beta just died out. Is that VETA? Yeah. That's better. Okay, so now that I feel like I'm like 60, um, <laughs> secure socket layer are uh, basically secure protocols. So it has to do with encoding and decoding at a, um, at a cryptographic level, right? So remember we did coding and, you know, Mrs. Bauer rocks, remember we did it on the board. Um, so this is like secure protocols over the internet. Um, special versions of the protocol are in widespread use in applications like web browsing, uh, email, internet faxing, VoIP. Now, you can do all of these things and not be secure, or you can do them and be secure, okay? Most of the time, when people want to send emails, they don't want the whole world accessing them. So there has to be some sort of um, protocol in place for securing those things. Same with internet banking. Surprisingly enough, we'd like that to be secure, okay? The whole um, internet, internet until you were able to purchase stuff on the internet was kind of just an academic thing. So the internet was in universities and some schools, right? But the likelihood of you having the internet at home wasn't very big until they brought in the fact that you could buy stuff off the internet. In order to buy stuff off the internet, people really need to have um, a sense that it is secure. So SSL helped do that. Okay. At the next level, which is communication and control, you have TCP and IP. Now, generally speaking, these things are seen together. TCP slash IP, you might have seen it before. Yeah. Okay. Um, they stand for Transmission, Control, Protocol, and Internet Protocol, which is here. Um, so TCP, IP basically help, um, help websites be served, but not at an application level. So it does a lot of the, um, the stuff like transferring files rather than just you typing in the address. This is the part where it actually transfers the file from a server to a client. Um, now, what it does is it has to do with um, the fact that you have um, Jordan here is going to type in um, www.google.com .au, sorry, Jamie. Um, into a web browser, right, and hit enter. That is at what level? Um, application level. Um, application level, good, okay. Now, his computer is going to go, hang on, I have to go to Google, right, and find the index file. So it's going to go uh, and send um, that information to Google, Justin. Right. Yeah, um, now, TCP IP handles addressing. So it comes from Jamie and goes to Justin, mind blank. Um, TCP IP handles where the address is. So it sends the message, it sends it on its merry little way, it says go to Justin or go to Google, all right, and the message goes. The next protocol actually deals with how it's going to get there, which is routing. Oh, hang on, sorry, IP, so TCP handles the fact that it's addressing, then IP, which is the internet protocol, handles the routing. Right? So I could go from Jamie to Justin by going like this. Okay? Or I could go from Jamie to Justin through that way. Okay? So TCP handles the addressing, IP actually handles the direction. So from computer to computer to computer across the internet which is why they're done together, because if you have um, one without the other, if you have addressing without routing, what's going to happen? It's going to go everywhere. It's going to upstate close to everyone. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So it might, it's going to go, hang on, I've got to get to Google. I'll just send this message out and hope that Google gets it. <laughs> right? Whereas with IP, it allows you to pick a pathway. Now, if you have IP without TCP, what happens? There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go, so it's no direction. Right, it's kind of like when I drive, I get lost very easily. Okay, the next one, Ethernet. 
The blue cable. Excellent. The blue cable. What's the blue cable called? It's an extended cable. It's called an Ethernet cable. What's an example of an Ethernet cable? Cat 5. Cat 5 or Cat 6 even. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. So they look like this. Yeah, the massive ones, aren't they? Yeah, big plugs. They are actually a twisted pair, which is technically a very um, old technology. So twisted pair is the types of, and there's like two wires, two wires like this, and they get twisted together. Right? Yeah, it's like coaxial cable. Yep. So um, Ethernet is made up of a number of twisted pair cables. So it's old technology used in a different way to make it new and faster. So what Ethernet does is connects the computers together. So this is on what level? So if you're talking about the actual sending of information, Transmission, excellent. Okay, so you're sending the information along the wire. Okay, token ring is another type of protocol that has to do with the transmission because it's talking about how information is passed. Now, remember, we did the ring the other day. What was the ring? The big circle, yep. And how did the message get from one part of the big circle to the other? Through every person. Okay, each node, excellent. But it was because we were doing people. Good use of terminology. Um, okay, now a token ring is a type of protocol. So remember the ring was the topology. Yeah. Okay, so it was the way that the computers connected together. With token ring, it's a way of working the ring. So what it does is it gives you, gets you a token. Right? This is a token. All right? When we pass the token around, don't spill my coffee, okay, you have the opportunity now to put a message in the token. Okay, what that means is that you can only send, don't you put anything in my coffee. Um, you can send the token around and you can only send the message if you have the token. So nobody's allowed to send the message at the moment except Jamie. Right? Jamie has to pass it on. Okay? And it only gets, it gets passed on like in milliseconds. It's not like, like Jamie's going, oh, this coffee looks pretty good. And, you know, I, I think I might have a message. Should I put it in there now or should I wait later? It gets like milliseconds. So you go, it, the token just continually gets passed around the system. Okay? So what happens is that if it's a really big message, sometimes it's like, oh, I've got the token. I'm going to break up my message now so I can fit it in the token. Oh, there goes the token. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes if it's a big message, it's actually not very efficient because you don't you only get the token for a short amount of time. Okay? And that is it.